All right. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin. And joining me today is none other than the legendary Christopher Summer, uh, gymnastics coach par excellence, and uh, without question, the number one authority on the topic of strength training, gymnastic style. I've been a follower of his for many years. I remember the first time I read through building the gymnastics body, it was like a revelation. I wasn't even ready to read all this stuff. I was just so mind blown. And we're going to talk a bit about a concept of training with just your own body weight to build fantastic levels of strength that very few people really know much of anything about. And uh, hopefully by the end, you will have a better understanding of how to do that. I uh, highly recommend all of his books, particularly Building the Gymnastics Body. Again, I think it's probably the greatest book ever written on the topic of bodyweight strength training. And uh, it, it's well, I mean, it's it's indispensable. It really is. So first and foremost, uh, thank you again for for being on the show. Uh, okay. I'm curious in particular because you have such an incredible set of skills. What is your origin story? Like, how did you get uh, interested in gymnastics to begin with? Was that something that started as a as a child? Was this uh, something that your parents encouraged you to do? How did you get interested in gymnastics? Accident. Accident. It was um, 1973. I'm sorry, 72. I was nine years old. And uh, the Olympics were stream or weren't stream. They were broadcast live. And uh, maybe nine or ten at night, the Japanese men came on. Uh, the Japanese men's team, and it was like uh, superheroes come to life. Couldn't get enough. Everyone else went to bed. We had the uh, old. No one will probably remember this. They had used to have big console TVs that sat on the ground. Big giant boxes look like a freezer. And I just stayed up most of the night as a little dude, just watching this. Uh, parents had no idea what to do with it. You know, we were, grew up pretty poor. Uh, they tried to do some stuff in the barn. We raised horses and such. But uh, then that went on pause till later on in high school. My high school happened to have a gymnastics team. And uh, didn't even know. No idea. Had been doing wrestling. And... Uh, came cruising through a gym with a buddy and saw these guys doing gymnastics and just sat down. And I was just like, what in God's name, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I sat there for three hours and, uh, of course, you know, bleachers in the gym, no one gives a crap. Here's this little dude, no one knows. And, uh, my buddy came back with me the next day. We sat for three hours. He got bored. Uh, I talked to the coach, asked if I could train. It was late in the school year, almost summer. And, uh, he's like, no, see me next fall. It's like, fine. So I sat there every day for three hours for weeks, just watching happy as could be. And, uh, I guess he had mercy on me and he invited me to train with him that summer at the university. And so, uh, yeah, kind of started from there was never, uh, she, you know, had to be pushed. There was never any of that. It was, you know, what can I get out of in order to train more? Absolutely. I think that's a really good recipe for success in general. You know, it's not like parents pushing you to do it or, you know, your friends kind of goading you into it. It was something that you were just so interested in. You were willing to spend three hours every single day just watching other people doing it, visualizing yeah. what they were doing, how you could do it. And what were some of the things that you noticed in particular when you started to practice that uh, all of a sudden you were you were able to do these things you couldn't do before? Uh, you made fast progress. Was was it what you had expected it was going to be, or was it just something that was like even beyond your expectations? Gym, gymnastics is is different than a lot of other sports. Where um, I have friends who you know train. I, I do a little bit of pro sports. So I have buddies. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. uh, NHL, Major League Baseball, uh, NFL, and a lot of them completely different than gymnastics gymnastics. We start with a young athlete and for the next 12 years, we do everything, mm -hmm. all the technical, all the psychological, all the physical prep, everything is us. Mm -hmm. And on the other sports, it's kind of a uh, survival of the fittest, you know, and they get, usually they get very poor training, mm -hmm. uh, very poor basics, very, there's no consistent preparation. I mean, I would have my athletes for, 
a decade. How many other, how many NFL coach or athletes have had the same coach developing them for a decade? Yeah. So for them, it's just, you know, you've got these incredibly gifted genetic specimens who survive things being done wrong. Mm. And then at the end of the day, it's still running and jumping and catching. So the physical package is kind of dominant. Mm -hmm. Whereas in gymnastics, so for me, I was extremely talented later on. Uh, world and Olympic champions have my frame. They're my height. They're my body weight. And I'm, I'm in uh, at Olympic training center with them. And we, we look like we're from the same family Difference is They had very good professional development and I didn't. Mm. So there, there was a lot of things I was learning, twisting double backs at the same time. I was learning uh, a single flip with a twist. So I was constantly crashing and getting hurt and the trainer in college would follow me around. But uh, my level of talent allowed the coaches to kind of try to skip things and do it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where gymnastic bodies came from was I had a world-class talent, but it didn't develop to a world-class level because of improper training and preparation. Yeah. That's something I think a lot of people forget about when they look at their favorite athletes, they think, oh, well, you know, he's super genetically gifted. He's super good. He this, that, and the other thing, but without the right training, they're not going to go anywhere, you know, like. So Tokyo, uh, my last lead athlete, Alan was, uh, alternate. Mm. And so people will look at Alan, you know, he's got gigantic arms, incredible physique, incredibly strong. And they're, they're going to say that very thing. You're so lucky you know, to be this talented. And I trained him for 16,000 hours from six years old till 18. So with me being just relent, people who've trained me, I'm just relentless. Yeah. Every detail, every small thing I've had athletes go, there's no one in the world who can see these small corrections. You're driving me crazy coach. And then that same athlete scores a 10 at a competition and they come over kind of sheepish and they're like, fine, fine. Okay. But, um, depending on what the sport is, basics are what are going to determine how far someone goes. Certainly. So, um, uh, there, there's a reason I can have a conversation with Navy SEALs, with world-class artists, with musicians, with billionaire hedge fund guys. And what we all have in common are just a dedication to basics. Not, not that we love doing the same thing over and over and over and over, but because it gets us where we want to go. Yeah. I, I read a great quote just today, actually, that, uh, you know, it was something to the effect of many, many boring days in a row are what lead to spectacular decades. I love that. Yeah. And I, I thought, you know, couldn't be more direct than that because if you have a constant need for entertainment, in yes. your training. I call it entertainment. Exactly. Exactly. And that sort of a thing I think is okay for people who want to be fit in general, and they don't necessarily want to be the best in the world or anything. But when you make Correct. the decision that you're going to be a Navy SEAL, you're going to be a gymnastics superstar, you're going to be a, a musician par excellence, you really have to be obsessed with absolutely That's refining and deepening. the. There's, there's no price too high. Exactly. And so, you know, if it's, if it's boring, it's boring. If it's hard, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And it might help for a lot of people to realize that for most of them, mediocre is what they want to be. Mediocre yep. is another name for average. It's, it's who they want to be. They're, they're not willing to make sacrifices like that. Yeah. They're not willing to miss birthdays and holidays and vacations. And my athletes would train when I was young, they would train on Christmas Eve We'd come back in, train a few days between Christmas and New Year's. I mean, we're, we're there constantly. Yeah. Not, not mean, not, uh, not harsh. It's just, guys, this is what it takes. Exactly. I remember many years ago reading a story about, I think it was like a long distance runner and it was Christmas and he didn't want to go out for a second run. And he thought, you know what? So-and-so, my opponent, I bet he's going to go out for a second run. So he went out for a second run that day. And then it was sometime later, maybe a few months later, he met up with him and they talked about their training. And he said, you know, on Christmas, 
I thought about you because I didn't want to go out for a second run. He said, oh, you only went out for two runs that day. <laughs> so, you know, and that's now I do, I do want to qualify that that is exactly the right attitude. It does need to be tempered with what your individual physical structure tolerates. Mm -hmm. So there are Olympic champions who've trained once a day. There are Olympic champions who train three times a day. Mm -hmm. And what is good for one will leave the other undertrained. What's good for the other one will leave the other overtrained. Right. And so, but it's kind of difficult to tell that to beginners or people getting started because they use that as an excuse to do less rather than more. Yeah. So, you know, some athletes, they peak, I've had athletes peak at 12, 14 hours a week and their body just, it's no longer functioning well. You know, things are falling apart, timing's off, they're tired. I have other athletes, you know, the more hours you give them, it's like a dry sponge soaking up water. Yeah. And everyone wants, everyone thinks that more is better. And it needs the caveat of more is better if that's what your body thrives on. Exactly. But if your body thrives on less, and you're true, that means then you have to control. So we'll back up a bit. A lot of your listeners may have noticed that most people, they'll start training, especially guys, young guys, and they'll train really hard for two, maybe three years, four years if they're a stud, mm -hmm. because everything is done with adrenaline, right? And that thrill of just being exhausted and they break themselves down and most of them hurt so bad after a few years they can't continue training yeah. i've seen that more times than i can count and so it kind of unfortunately you can't develop the maturity of not pushing yourself too hard until you've pushed yourself too hard and then you've run into that those problems and very few people are capable or intelligent enough to learn from someone else's mistake yeah. they'll hear it they'll give it lip service but until they've gotten their fingers slammed in the door and they don't really believe in their heart that it applies to them too. Exactly. They're always the special case. I think it's very hard for people. I always like to say it. It's like, you might know something intellectually, but until mm -hmm. you've experienced it or until you feel it, you don't really understand it. And I think that overtraining, especially among young males is like super, super common. It's just, again, it's always more Weight, better. Weightlifting. My gosh, some, some of them, like so many joint injuries because yeah. they, they go too hard. You know, they just, and they, they won't push because it, it's, it's not, it's not training, it's ego lifting, yeah. you know, and it's not. So if we're, if I'm training an example is they look, they look at an elite gymnast and see he's training, we'll call it compared to a normal person training. So we, we would consider a, a workout three hours, four hours, that would be one workout for us. And if you have two of those a day, we'd call that two training. But for a normal person, what's that? Seven trainings. And so they're, they're going to immediately want to do what elites do. And they don't understand is that same athlete who's doing 30, 32 hours a week as a mature athlete started with one hour once a week, way back when. And he did that for a year. Yeah. And then, okay, we bump them to two hours, maybe if they're good enough. Yeah. And then a little over a period of years, we increase it. Whereas an adult, they want to give it a few months. Mm -hmm. And of course the joints can't take it. They get hurt. You know, little ones just want to have a good time. It's my job to monitor it appropriately. But an adult, they've got this picture in their head that I've got to do it now. And they try to cheat time. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting you bring this up because this is something I would say over the past 10 years, I've gotten more and more interested in, and that is training in such a way where the joints are not only protected, but actually strengthened. And I think yes. that you're one of the first people I've ever heard talk about how not just to do that, but then how to do that. And, and I'm, I'm very curious, uh, what are some of the general principles that need that people need to keep in mind about joint preparation We'll say specifically Good question. For gymnastics, um, but also well, how about how about just as an athlete? Perfect, yeah. Because a human body is a human body. Uh, people should take a take a moment after this and look up on YouTube. Do a do a search for uh, four thousand frames a second karate chop, mm. and the guy is breaking a brick, and they're going to slow it down to four thousand frames of video a second, and they're going to see we're taught that. Uh, 
as we get stronger, the bones get rigid, right? And the bones get thicker, they get denser. And that's not what happens. What happens, what they'll see when this guy uh, breaks bricks, they're going to see his bones fold over on each other, almost like they're liquid. And what they become is uh, springer, if you will, more resilient. So the reason older adults fall down and break a hip is that bone flexes, but then it's not strong enough to come back. It keeps flexing and it breaks. Mm. And once they look at that karate chop, they can start doing 4,000 frame a second and watch tennis players. Watch that tennis player slide across the court and watch a femur bend sideways. Not the knee, not the, the femur bending sideways and coming back, but it happens so fast we don't see it. Mm-hmm. And so what they've actually found is um, weightlifting is moderately good for increasing bone density. But surprisingly, what's better, it's been tested in older adults, jump rope is more productive. Interesting. Because, because of the impact, the multiples of body weight. This is why we see very few times do we see someone who's a beast, the strongest guy in the, in the gym, super strong, be a great athlete on the field. Yeah. Almost, almost never unless he's a strength athlete. Mm-hmm. So I watched, uh, I chuckle, I chuckle about it every time. Uh, the guy who won the 92 Olympics in shot put was interviewing with a strength coach and he had shared extensively that when he stopped lifting heavy and went all the way down to his squats to body weight or less and added in jump squats, that's when his throws went out and the strength coach just couldn't accept it. He said, yeah, but you used to lift heavy. And he said, yes, when I lifted heavy, my performance went down. Mm -hmm. I was slower. I was stiffer. I wasn't as resilient. He said, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh but you used to lift heavy. And he said, yeah, but for the year and a half, two years before the Olympics, I didn't. I said, yeah, but you used to, because they've been taught so much that, you know, the stronger you get, the better. And we do need strength, but we need an optimal surplus of strength, Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever your sport is and what can your particular phenotype handle. Right. Right. Some people are natural. So I was extremely fast and had a really high vertical but I'm also thinner and lighter of frame. So yeah, I could do when I started, go right to a double body weight deadlift. But so what my ring national champion on rings, the first day he ever deadlifted, he pulled 405. He did triple body weight for him and was like, okay. And the, uh, we used to laugh the gym, the strength. So they have the strength records at the gyms for universities. We'll take university of Nebraska they had an assistant coach from there. He'd been an athlete, Mm -hmm. clean bench, jerk, overhead, press squat. All those records pound for pound were owned by the gymnasts, Mm. which really surprised me. I expected that to be wrestlers. I didn't expect it to be football players. I expected the maxes to be owned by the football players, but I didn't think pound for pound, the relative strength would be on. It was all gymnasts. And kind of coming, circling back around to where we were. And the reason gymnasts get strong isn't the conditioning that everyone thinks it is. It's not handstand pushups. It's not rope climbs. It's, it's not iron crosses. It's not planges. Those are all preparatory. Mm. What makes gymnasts strong is all the plyometric work. So remember, I, w- I was a national team coach for, I don't know, in between 30 and 40 years, we'll call it 35, 36 years, Mm -hmm. long time. And spent a lot of time at Olympic training center over the years, a lot of testing pressure plates, sensors on the athletes, just tumbling, not, not a world-class skill, but just a basic backflip out of a back handspring 14 times body weight. Wow. Day in, day out. My college coach liked us to get 1500 reps in over the course of training, all different events. The round off would be one back handspring one back. That'd be three. Mm-hmm. Uh, now think about what that did to the frame. Think about what it did to the joints. Yeah. We didn't back in my day, we didn't have, unless you happen to be training with a world-class coach, we didn't have access to good conditioning. Once in a while, a coach would say, go do 50 pull-ups. Yeah. 
okay, well, doing 50 pull-ups three times a year doesn't really do anything to you. Yeah. But I went right to chins with almost half body weight. Never trained them. Went right to grow. And it's important for people to understand as a gymnast, strength wise, I was just okay. Mm -hmm. It's not like I was the beast walking around in the gym. I was just regular guy. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of guys who are way stronger than me, but it was that constant exposure and not, it's not what they call plyometrics. I, I chuckle about this a lot, but they confuse hopping with rebounding. Yeah. So they'll do. So I was I, in preparation for this. I was reviewing some, uh, some depth jumps and some rebounds and they were, they wanted them to go from 12 inches to three feet. If they were advanced, our guys were jumping from nine and 12 feet. Wow. They were, uh, the goal was not to land and jump because the tumbling happens so fast. There's no time to jump. You're trying to keep your body as rigid and as tight as possible. And then rebounding off the ligaments and the tendons. Yeah. There's no time to use muscle. It can't be done. And so that's where that 14 times body weight, a ring, a giant on rings where they're in a handstand and they swing back up to handstand. Depending on technique, we measured it seven to 10 times body weight. Incredible. So the thing, thing about that, if I'm a 150 pound athlete, I might every time I do, and what if I do four turns, four giants in a turn? A 6,000 pounds of pressure I was just exposed to in about a minute. Yeah. Maybe a minute and a half. And that's one turn of one day mm. out of a week, out of a month, out of years. And that's where you, you turn a gymnast loose in the weight room. First time in college, they ever walked me into a weight room. I just went in and was working with the big monsters. Yeah. Here's little me, 130 pounds. And these guys are just like, what in the world? All yeah. the other guys have been busting their butt for years. Like, And so I, I think it's because I'm God's gift. No, it's from the gymnastics. Yeah. But what it does is it, it, your joints now are protected enough that you can work on doing strength work. You can work on doing hypertrophy without getting hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, but see the gym, the gymnasts don't fit in the strength results. They can't, they can't track it because they don't know how to train it. Mm -hmm. So they, they keep things. So I did years ago, I did a uh, dynamic strength seminar for uh, Poliquin headquarters. Mm went out and spent a day doing that. And uh, I spent all day doing drills and mobility and prepping them for it to actually get to doing lock arm rebounding plyometric strength. Wow. They were done. There were strong athletes in there. There were strong athletes. Like, and one, an example for listeners is get into a push up position, arms locked no arching the back and just through the shoulders, just bouncing up and down in place. These guys were glued to the floor, couldn't move. And I've got six year olds that don't even notice it. Mm -hmm. And so what we find is that an athlete needs that I, You can call it plyometric, you can call it dynamic strength, whatever you want, but that's gotta be the end goal we're aiming for, for athletic development. There's a reason that, they will prefer Olympic lifting over heavy power lifting most of the time mm -hmm. for training athletes because the max strength stuff is going to make you slow. Mm -hmm. Taken too far, always. You can see it. They run like a Clydesdale. Yeah. You know? And then uh, the Olympic lifting at least gives them an opportunity to incorporate some speed into it. Mm -hmm. But even at Olympic lifting, they're not getting close to 14 times body weight. Yeah. It's just not happening, but then they don't know how to scale things. You know, how do you introduce it? So the, the first time I worked with adults, um, they had made themselves so strong that if I tried to do plyometrics with them, like I would do with six year olds, mm -hmm. it would hurt themselves. They hurt their ankles, their knees, their lower back, uh, their shoulders constantly. And so it's really strange. It's like they had built their body wrong because athletically you're going to be moving. 
it's, it's a ballistic environment, right? You're, you're wrestling with your friends and someone's getting thrown down and you bounce up off the ground or you're jumping off this, you're rolling on that, you're climbing, you're slipping, you're falling. There's, there's impact, there's impact, there's impact, there's impact. And what gets overlooked is we grow up in that dynamic ballistic environment. And then we get into high school and we start doing some training and we assume it's the training responsible for the athleticism rather than all those prior years of playing and running around. Mm -hmm. And we get older and we're just doing our skill training and we're just doing the strength work and we're getting farther and farther away from that matrix of just movement all the time. Yeah. And then this thing start breaking down and then the surgeons come in and say, you know, cartilage breaks down when you're 35. I said, well, did it? Or did you get a job when you were 22? And then through your 20s, you gradually had less and less and less activity. Mm -hmm. Now you're not running, you're not jumping, you're certainly not sprinting. And then you hit 30, late 20s and 30. Now you're married, you got kids, there's no time. By the time you're 35, you've been set for hitting the gym for 45 minutes, three times a week. You're almost relatively inactive. Yeah. And then you try to use your knee playing softball and you blow your knee out coming around first base. And they say, yeah, it's because you're old. It's not because you're old. It's because you haven't done anything of a plyometric nature in forever and your body's deconditioned. Yeah. And for people who are in that position, because, you know, a lot of people, they reach their late twenties, early thirties, maybe early forties. And they realize, oh my gosh, I've been practically sedentary all this time. I need to get back to what I'm doing. Well, you know, the natural thing is they think, I'll go back to doing what I was doing in high school or what I was doing in college and their bodies have, have regressed and they need to build back up. And uh, I think you're hundred percent spot on about the importance of this dynamic element, because it's so common to see people who lift super heavy, very strong, but they slip and fall and they break something. There was a story some years ago about a guy I knew who was trying to chase down a purse snatcher and he broke his heel, you know, imagine that. Right. Yeah. And if he could have gotten his hands on him, Mm -hmm. It would have been a different story, but being able to move and be resilient. So it's like, uh, I'll explain it. The resiliency allows the body to kind of take impact abuse. If you want to go that far without injury to absorb impact and to generate impact without injury Mm -hmm. and if you don't train for it right then of course it's going to break it's always the weak link that breaks so the hard the hard thing though is that it's like we mentioned earlier it takes time yeah and no one wants to do that no one wants to do that you know remember we were if you're in your 20s you look down oh i don't have abs i I just won't eat as much at lunch today by dinner you got your abs back again Okay, well, that's not happening when you're 30, and it's definitely not happening when you're 50. And by 60, you know, I, I just hope I don't die getting off the couch. Yeah. Right? And it's not, it's not that that's what the human body should do. It's just, it, it's, in, it's in the definition of disease. It's dis-ease. Yeah. You know, there's no longer ease of movement. There's no longer a full range of motion. They... Uh, why does their why does their ACL tear? Well, they never do any ACL prep. Why is their MCL tear? They never do any MCL tear prep. And it, we can go on and on. Why'd my rotator go? Well, what have you done for your rotator? I did bench press. Okay. Well, that's okay. If you like, if you're built for bench, do you have short arms? Do you have a barrel chest? Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe you're okay for bench. What if you have long arms? Why are you benching? Why? Or, okay, well, why aren't you going to do dumbbell press so that we can internally rotate those shoulders instead of externally rotate under ma- externally rotated under maximum load? Really? What, what were you thinking? Why didn't you at least use a Swiss bar or a football bar so you could go to a neutral grip yes. or dumbbells? Well, it's really hard to get the dumbbells up in place. Okay. Maybe you shouldn't be going so heavy. It's, it's that ego lifting. Yeah. And I, I always find it interesting that they, they kind of hear what they want to hear. 
and they disregard the rest. Yeah. So they, they're going to go hard every single day. And that someone like Ed Cohn, he was only going to peak at his competition. And then he's going to drop down. If he's squatting a thousand, then he's going to drop down to 700 pounds. Yeah. Now imagine how light 700 pounds is when you can do a thousand, do you even notice it? Yeah. But they need, they need that gratification of that ego instead of a nice quote. I like is most people underestimate or vastly overestimate how much they can accomplish in a single day. We're procrastinators by nature as humans, right? So they think they can do more than they can, but they vastly underestimate how much they can accomplish in a year. If they were just calm and methodical, I, I told my students, think of it like a novel. If I ask you to write a 365 page novel today, you'd say you've lost your mind. But if I ask you to write a 365 page novel, not necessarily good or not, but just the volume in a year, now you only got to do a page a day. Yeah. Very, very different. But most people aren't well, most people can't stay focused for a year. Yeah. Exactly. Can't. You know, the ironic thing about that too is that it's actually easier to do the second option. So, so many people look at things like they look at out, they have outcome goals, which aren't necessarily bad, you know, mm -hmm. but if you want to be fit for life and you want to get stronger and more resilient, it's so much easier to focus on just what do I need to do today? And then I'm going to do it again tomorrow. And then after that, like the, the incremental improvement is going to happen. If you're almost not going to notice it. And then you're going to look we'll back it. and you're going to be like, I can't even believe how far I've gotten. But so many people. So, don't that's why that. I like them to do. They won't do it most of the time, mm -hmm. but I like, I like them to use an SSC. So it was, it was a program. So steady, steady state cycle, mm -hmm. something that I created with my athletes where let's say they were doing could be a Jefferson Crow, could be a deadlift, could be a trap bar, doesn't matter, but it would be part, my athletes would do it as part of their warm up. Mm -hmm. And so I had, just as an example, I had a, how heavy was Heath? He was a little dude, 112, 116 pounds. He's a little guy. And uh, he had bumped up into my group. So we started him with 135 pounds. Mm -hmm. So he had to do two sets of two to three reps. I didn't care. It was Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. In the beginning, so we're, and we're looking for a 12 week cycle, give or take. I, I made them stay there till they were bored. It was so easy. They were bored and they were coming up and they were begging, please. Can I add some more ways? How long has it been? Let me see. No, not yet. You just, you just driving them crazy on purpose. Yeah. And so initially in the beginning, there should be overload. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. But we're notice we're never going to increase the weight. We're not going to increase frequency. Everything's going to stay the same. Reps or volume is going to stay the same. Well, he did his 135. In the beginning, there'd be days where he said, you know, I'm kind of tired today. Let's give it a day. Yeah, no problem. This is four days a week. What do I care if he misses one? We get to the end of the cycle and he's not even noticing anymore. And he's a happy guy. It's 135. Now, he says, can I add some weight? Go ahead. So he grabs some tens. He wants to slide some tens on. Does it? Well, I won't say what I said. We get a little colorful in the gym. So <laughs> insert your profanity of choice. Sure. But uh, basically, I made fun of his manhood. I said, "Don't put a dime on there. I want to see twenty fives on." He's like, "I am not going from one thirty five to one eighty five. I said, "You just shut up and put the twenty fives on." Yeah. He put twenty fives on. Now he's gone from one thirty five, which he's done for three months, to one eighty five at a body weight of, I can't remember, it's 112, 116. Mm -hmm. The bar flies off the ground. He's like, oh, starts taking the 25s off and he wants to put 45s on. I said, that's not happening, dude. Yeah. That's not happening. Could he have pulled 225? Probably. But bigger jump than I wanted him to do. Mm -hmm. But what he had done is over that 12 weeks, he'd gone through three phases. He'd gone through overload to load to underload. Mm -hmm. And it's the underload where everything stabilizes. Yeah. Everything heals. We're building a strength surplus. Yeah. And then we go, but people don't want to do that. Interestingly, that after I had mentioned that in that first book, people started applying it. 
Pavel started sharing it with some people and uh, we would get weightlifters who would get up to goodness gracious, 400 pounds as small guys without ever having strained in their training. Yeah. Would, would I train most athletes that way? No, but it's a nice, it's a nice illustration of how much can be accomplished with some patience and what I would call a blue collar work ethic. Mm -hmm. Just kind of show up, do your thing, no drama, no carrying on, be consistent and leave. Just come in, do your thing, leave. It's going to be boring. Yeah, it is. Now that first cycle is going to be really hard for them. That first cycle, they're hard because they're like, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring. And you're kind of having to push them and they have to take it on faith. Yeah. Once they get that first cycle and they get that next big jump, now they're sold. They're like, seriously? Mm -hmm. Now the hard thing is, all right, if you want the same results, you have to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure I could do it in six weeks this time. Maybe. Are you really willing to take that chance? You know that this other worked. Yeah. So you notice most people that want and they have something that works, what's the very first thing they do? Screw it up. If this is working, this other thing will work better. Yeah. It's kind of like a surfer who's on a wave. It's a great wave. He's having a great ride. And he sees another wave out of the corner of his eye. So he jumps off this great wave to go get on another wave that may or may not be there when he gets there. Yeah. Ride the wave you're on when that one's gone. It's not working anymore. You're not getting results. Okay then mess with it, but they won't, they won't do it. Most people won't. Yeah. It's the difference I think between training, uh, training for records and training for life. And the people who I, I remember reading a quote by, I think it was maybe Pyotr Krylov, who's old, old school, strong man, just crazy strong. And he only lifted heavy maybe once a week and most of his training you know was basically done during his shows because he was a traveling circus strongman okay. and he talked about being in his 40s he said his muscularity hadn't changed since he was in his 20s whereas all the 20 somethings were burning out they're getting hurt because they were training for records and he had a very conservative approach to his own training and he ended up you know performing into his 60s and he was still oh. doing stuff that was insane it's, it's funny you mentioned that because they used to believe you shouldn't train with any intensity till you were 30. Uh huh. They wanted, they wanted your physical structure to be completely mature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you can train. Yeah. Now you can train. You were considered a baby prior to that. Right. Whereas now you're done. Hang it up. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a little bit like, uh, in an emergency, can I slam on my brakes and skid into a stop sign? Yeah, I can. Just because I can, does that mean I should do it every day when I'm driving? I have a bad idea. My tires aren't going to be lasting very long and I'm going to spend a lot of money on tires. Mm -hmm. Problem with if you're doing that with the body is you can't go out and buy another body like you can buy another set of tires. Yeah. And the, the new set of joints and stuff like that that you're buying are not going to work like the ones that God gave you. So without, without belaboring it, I had, I had a really bad cancer. Mm had a really bad cancer and um, dropped down to shoot. Can't remember if it was 113 or 114 pounds, beautiful shade of gray. I thought I was very fetching. My wife disagreed. Uh, once that was gone, whole nother story in itself, the, uh, that specific treatment body weight came back easy, mm -hmm. but what it had destroyed was connective tissue. Mm. And so it took, seemed forever at the time, it took me a year and a half to get back to a single pull-up. Wow. Yeah. Year and a half down from, you know, 55, 75 pounds hanging on me. So mm -hmm. just a single body weight because the joints and the hands just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. And so it was, it was a really nice illustration of... Uh, Developing hypertrophy is pretty straightforward. Okay. If, if we're looking at dense muscle tissue, right? Not, and it's, and you can, you can build a dense muscle tissue with bodybuilding methods by just manipulating your rest interval. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right? So the reason they do the short rest intervals is they want, there's, there's muscle tissue within the cell, the myofibril, and then there's sarcopla sar sarcoplasmic, which is the fluids in between the cells, mm -hmm. which is that pump, which is what they get from the really short rest periods. Yeah. So instead of doing a 30 second or a 60 second rest period between sets, just bump it out to recovery, two, three minutes minimum. And you can still do all the things you like. Mm -hmm. You just won't have that enormous pump, yeah. which of course, that's why you see the bodybuilders are terrified to not be in a gym because, you know, I, I'm going to lose my pump while well, they're losing that fluid retention. Yeah. Because you should be, you shouldn't have to be in the gym constantly to retain some muscle. Yeah. You may lose your peak, but if, if someone is not in, is in the gym, isn't in the gym and they're shrinking away, literally shrinking away, they're either doing the high volume, low intensity, and they're not wrong with low intensity, but those extreme slow, small rest intervals or they're juicing. Yeah. And then of course, you know, whatever they spent years, they said, you know, sometimes you'll see some of these guys who uh, in three months, they basically just peed it all away oh, yeah. and it's, it's gone. Yeah. And I'm, I question that if it's not real, it's, it's the illusion that you were an athlete. Yeah. Why did you, I guess from an aesthetic purpose, it's, it's their life. They do what they want. Yeah. But if it doesn't last, why? Yeah. And if you can't do it without it, can you really do it at all? Well, that's a good point. It's a good point. So for us, for gymnasts, the steroids and that don't work because they, they increase mass through the fluid retention, mm -hmm. but and they get stronger, no question they get stronger, and it increases recovery. But what it doesn't do is increase connective tissue strength and joint strength. Mm -hmm. So you actually get strong enough that if you try to be athletic, they tear a quad. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if people realize how serious if a quad gets tore, tore, you may lose the leg. Just that blood pouring in there is such a huge wound. Yeah. It's like how many people who aren't doing that tear a quad? Yeah. You know, and then, but in their defense, most people have never either themselves or an athlete, they haven't gotten them too strong. Mm -hmm. I've done it long enough where I have gotten people too strong and too strong by measured in terms of athletic performance. Mm -hmm. They're slow, they're stiff. So Alan, Alan at might've been 12, might've been 12 at a national team camp stronger than most of the eight 17 and 18 year olds there but i was watching him climb the rope and it looked like a tree sloth and i was like huh and i kept seeing symptoms of this and so we went home and i, I changed everything said, you know you're strong enough so everything then instead of doing handstand push-ups under load they became hopping handstand push-ups mm -hmm. and every, everything became explosive yeah. That was the year he won nationals. Well, a year later is when he won nationals. And uh, kind of like I, you mentioned, you did a good job mentioning it earlier is are we, are we training for a particular goal? Is, is the goal, are you going to be a power lifter? Okay. Do your thing. Mm -hmm. Be aware, however, how many power lifters, when they stop lifting, immediately change everything about their training and start going crazy for mobility because they hurt so bad. Oh yeah. So, okay, do it. But maybe with an eye kind of on longevity also, there was a great guy. I used to watch him on YouTube, small, 140 pounds, Asian guy, 400 pound bench. And it was just great, great videos. He, he just start with, you know, bar 135 work his way up high reps but he went to the well too often and then after because everyone loved it of course we all have an ego yep. and so too too much and uh, eventually you know his bench was down at three and then eventually you know we, we didn't see him posting anymore just because you know he'd slid into that stop sign too often yeah so kind of you know what is your goal in life we had, we had one student who uh, I would have never trained him. He, his knees were destroyed. Mm. His knees were destroyed. There were 
nuts and bolts and screws and everything. And he, he couldn't walk. He couldn't walk. And he was upset because he couldn't carry his children. He had little ones, couldn't mm -hmm. do stairs. And uh, he never reached out to me, but he, he took my, my knee mobility series, mm -hmm. ACL, MCL, all that stuff. And he started doing it, but his range of motion was so poor. He could go from a stand to the top of a high bar stool. And over the course of a year, he built, he built full range of motion. Wow. And he, he, uh, he sent me a note. He was so excited. He's so excited. He says, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm conflicted. And I said, All right, what's there to be conflicted about? He said, well, I feel so good. I can do everything I want it. My knees were completely destroyed. I go to my therapist. I tell him what's happened and I show him what I can do now. And he says, you need to stop immediately. Exactly what I did. I <laughs> just see your face is me too. I was like, hey, he's a coach. I don't know what to do. I said, you need to get a new therapist. He's an idiot. Yeah. Because what, what we find is uh, there are very few true experts, if you will. Yeah. There are very few true experts who actually have, and this isn't just an old guy speaking because I'm an old guy, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I learned a lot of my stuff from the old experts also. Mm -hmm. right? we, we can go over that pedigree later. You know, but we get these young guys who become gurus who are naturally genetically gifted. They're mesomorphs, mm -hmm. huge degree of hypertrophy, and they were going to be built regardless of what they did. It didn't matter. They yeah. could be, you know, I picked up water bottles today <laughs> and, you know, my arms grew a quarter of an inch. Yeah. That's, that's not a normal human being's experience. So these guys then with no experience in developing that same degree of athleticism and others give bad advice. Oh, yeah. kind of, and of course, because it's the fitness industry, it's who screams the loudest is going to get the most attention. Who can make the most outrageous claim? Yeah. And that's not the case. No, no one cares when you're trying to make an Olympic team, how loud you are. Yeah. No one cares. Every, everyone knows a national team. You won nationals. You didn't win nationals. And that was my world. I came from where you didn't need to make any noise. Yeah. Everyone knew who the studs are. Mm -hmm. You're good. And you see one, maybe a coach does well once. Maybe he had that genetic outlier, but he's never done it again. Well, maybe it's just bad luck, but I put kids on national team every place I've ever been. Mm -hmm. So by that theory, I just happened to get lucky that every gym I landed in around the country had genetically superior athletes. And I was just, you know, blessed. Yeah. So, you know, if you can replicate it. So a lot of these, these people, you know, that someone you want, you like what they're doing. Great. Can they, and they have students who've replicated results. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get some of the wannabes who say, uh, sorry, I know wannabe is going to trigger some people tough, old old army guy, your yeah. feelings don't matter to me. I could care less yeah. and top that on top of being a national team coach, whatever it is, what it is. Yeah. But the wannabes, they, uh, they try to put forward. If you can't do it, you don't know what you're teaching. Yeah. And I always find that humorous. Can you imagine that Usain Bolt's coach, the sprinter, his coach has to be able to run as fast as Usain Bolt. Never seen that. No. I've, I've never seen any coaches at a national championships out there doing as well as their athletes. It's, yeah. it's a transition. And then in that same line, a lot of times we find the very great athletes tend to be poor coaches. Certainly. Because so, it's a different skill set. So this, this is an example. Um, Sherba is a friend of mine. He won six gold medals at the 92 Olympics and he moved into my part of the country. I was like, shit, <laughs> it's Sherba. I'm about to get my ass thoroughly stomped. Yeah. And it was exactly the opposite. It was the opposite. And so that first year, you know, he's Russian, mm -hmm. he's Russian, Belarusian. And, you know, he was mad. 
We didn't know each other. And he's mad, Russian mad, which is an interesting experience. It's a whole different and, level of mad. It's a whole different level. It's a little bit like, I don't know, pissed off ga- Russian gangster. It's hard to describe. And then uh, they're not emotional to start with. And then the second year it happened again. Now he's really annoyed because who's, who's this nobody? He's never been in a world Olympic team. Mm-hmm. This is, this is embarrassing that this little American guy's kicking my ass. He's pissed. Yeah. And then the third year it happens again. And he just punches me in the shoulder. He says, God damn it, Chris. And it was fine. But what he had been learning over that period, it, it took Vitaly 10 years to become a good coach, despite having been good enough athlete to have six gold medals. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if someone's longevity is important to them, if their goals are important to them, if their progress is important to them, they really need to go out, regardless of the area, they really need to go after the best instruction, you know, that they can get access to. Yeah. You can figure it out on your own. I often wonder about this because we don't, we don't have, now there's masters of sport in Europe and in Russia. Sure. We don't have that here. You kind of you figure stuff out on your own. Yeah. You know, I've been lucky enough to interact with, you know, Olympic level coaches from all around the world, but I had to earn my way into that group. So then I could pick those brains. It wasn't like I was in my gym and all these great coaches came by and said, I've got some nuggets I want to share with you. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work that way. No. So, you know, regardless of what was kettlebell, it's weightlifting, it's Olympic lifting, you know, choose carefully whether it's gymnastics, whether it's Cal, I love how the calisthenics guys go out of their way to say it's calisthenics or street workers, but it's not gymnastics. Yeah. Even though they're using all my progressions, they're using all my exercises, but they'll change it from a 60 second hold to a 22 second hold. Yeah. And it's different. Okay, guys, if that makes you happy or we're going to do a plunge, but it's not a gymnastics plunge because my toes aren't pointed. Okay. I was like, I'm going to run a sprint, but it's not a sprint because I turned my hat around backwards. Yeah, exactly. All right. But they, they notice as they, they get more mature, it gets closer and closer and closer to what gymnastics is. Now they're doing their dynamic work on the single bar, which is like the gymnastics we used to do in the 50s. Yeah it'll keep coming and why why is gymnastics where it is today simply because the techniques had evolved in efficiency to allow these things to be done Mm -hmm. gymnastics is the only sport that's happened they're still doing the same dives today they were doing 40 50 60 years ago but gymnastics today compared to 50 60 years ago is different world yeah my god some of the stuff that i've taught i never had a prayer doing no, yeah. no way. So you know, choose carefully. And then if longevity is your thing, what's where's the fire? Yeah, where's you got the, the rest of your life. Yeah. And eventually that's a nice thing. You've got the rest of your life. So if you want to be a world champion, just do moderate and be the last guy in your age group alive. You win. Exactly. It's just attrition at that point, yeah. you know. You win. No. On the topic of goals and achievement and all this other stuff, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the incredible programs you have. I think some of the best money I've ever spent on any fitness related anything was your foundation series. I got it when I didn't even have a couple hundred bucks to my name. I was like, I need this. And I I prospered from it greatly. And I told everybody, I was like, you have to get this. And of course, you know, like, you know, look at the price, look at this and that. I'm like, yeah, but look at what you're going to get out of it. it. It's just incredible. Now, where can people follow you? Where can they find your programs and get access to these hard won secrets that you've used to turn? Okay. Uh, gymnasticbodies.com. Mm-hmm. And so um, two tiers. So, and I laugh when they thought, so the, you know, Alan, 12 years, $450 a month. Look at him now. Look at him now. Yeah, he's in med school now. Uh, you know, quality costs, Yeah, quality costs. And I'll, I'll tell people, and they don't have to spend money with me and they spend it wherever, but sure. you have to pay for quality. You, you never see a Porsche on sale. And years ago, cause I, I grew up really poor. I grew up really. And so, uh, worked really hard and I was just putting money in the bank, money in the bank, money in the bank. And 
maybe 20 years ago, my wife was like, so you're going to die with a lot of money in the bank? That's my current plan. <laughs> plan. She's like, well, you've got meetings, you've got this, you've got that. You kind of, you don't care about this stuff, but the public cares about this stuff. You kind of need to arrive in such a way that makes a good impression. So that was my first time, you know, going in and driving a Porsche. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shoot. If I'd have known this, I'd have busted my butt to drive this thing a long, long time ago. And it's, it's that same way with training. Yeah. You, you, can, you can stumble around, right? And you can, uh, maybe it's good, maybe it's not. It's, it's not just my program. It's, it's anyone who's doing a high-level program. We can go with other names, you know, there's, it's not mine is the only thing that works in the entire world. It's not the case, mm -hmm. but quality costs. Yeah. So they can go as low as uh, these are on-demand courses mm -hmm. and they're not just on-demand where most, most of the people's courses will be uh, a PDF or a YouTube link. Mm -hmm. our, our courses are designed to be interactive. Mm -hmm. So they can go in, they can follow a progression for beginners up into intermediate. That'll give them step-by-step step what they want. They can adjust all the programming parameters that work for them. Mm -hmm. They sets, reps, time, time under tension, uh, days they want to train, where they want to start. And then it'll create a follow along video for them. There's another one. We, we have a part of our audience that they get bored and they just, they can pick a particular level of material and it'll create a uh, random workout for them within their level. Mm -hmm. Some people like that. They don't, they don't want to come in and just kind of be methodical day in and day out. Then they get, the system also allows them to build their own to customize. So they can come in and they can take anything from our library put it together and it'll create follow along videos for them, counting reps and everything. Now I am getting ready to, uh, that'll cost them between 15 and $30 a month, mm -hmm. depending on if they want to do a uh, annual or a monthly, mm -hmm. it's up to them. And then there is a new product being released where, and for that level, they don't get a lot of interaction with me. Sure. I do, I do have a new product that'll be coming out where they have a lot more access to me. But uh, it's considerably more expensive, it's about $450 a quarter. Mm -hmm. But there's, we do a lot of, just like today was this discussion, we, we do several of these a month for them. You know, uh, some are shorter, some are long, just depending, it's all training related. And then there's other templates that over the years I haven't shared, they're all available there. Mm -hmm. That's forthcoming. But what, whether it's me or whether it's someone else, you know, health matters, longevity matters. Mm -hmm. So choose carefully. And then something you like. Yeah. Because if you like it, you'll be consistent with it. And if walking is your thing, that's awesome. Walk. If you're a runner, you know, run. If you're a swimmer, swim. If hot yoga is your thing, I've got a student that loves hot yoga. Totally fine. I, I almost don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. right? As long as you're not damaging yourself doing it and it has reasonable balance. Now you can't just do all yoga. Have you, have you noticed how yoga has, so when we first released way back when we, we destroyed the yoga market, mm. we destroyed it. They couldn't, they couldn't compete. You know, their, their handstands weren't right. They couldn't do the joint prep. And now they call it yoga strength, which is basically my GST, but mm -hmm. rebranded. Yeah. That's okay. That's, I, I'd rather, I'd rather it was used than not used because sure. a lot of times what we see with yoga is they get really, really flexible. And if they only keep doing strength, we've had students come in who are hardcore yoga, who actually ripped the hamstring off their pelvis or they'll come in, you know, and they're so weak. There's no core, there's no pressing, there's no pulling. And then of course we have the other extreme where they only do strength, can't move, can't bend, you know, that I was terrified years ago. I went to a uh, state powerlifting meet here in Arizona, and I'd never seen so many broken bodies in my life. So you know, you, you kind of want something. You want you want something in the middle that's going to allow you to be challenged, but it's not going to destroy you at the same time. Yeah. So without going off, there's you no know, choose wisely. Certainly. But um, there's a lot, especially today. 
I mean, look at the conversation we're having in today's day and age. Technology allows us to have conversations that we couldn't have had in the past. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't that we were stuck up and we were too good and this and that. I was at Olympic Training Center. You know, and if, if you didn't come through the doors at Olympic Training Center, right, we weren't going to be able to have a conversation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now today things are different, but there's the flip side of that coin is there are people who are dispersing information that really shouldn't be. Yeah. So it's that, that caveat still applies of buyer beware. Right. So you do your due diligence, regardless of what your modality that you enjoy is do some research, mm-hmm. you know, don't, don't make a purchase or a follow just because someone had a nice soundbite. Definitely. You know, cause it could end up costing you down the road, but if you choose carefully, the other applies also longevity, increased performance, no pain. Right. One of the reasons we got popular is physical therapists around the world started using my joint prep routines mm-hmm. and they were getting better results than what they had learned in therapy school. Yeah. Uh, Jefferson curl, for example, mm-hmm. when I first shared Jeff Jefferson curl, I was burned at the stake. Oh yeah. I was it burned was at the stake. How dare you? Oh, and people don't realize today cause it's so accepted. Yeah. Because it was proven because I was like, well, try it yourself. Here's the progression. Start light. Now it's so common. Everyone thinks it's always been common. I don't realize that was not the case. Yeah. So you see mobility everywhere now. A lot of people will think, well, he's just jumping on the bandwagon. No, the bandwagon started with us. Yeah. We shared what we were doing with my elite athletes and people had never seen it. Yeah. And then there was all, because anything new is always going to get pushed down. Oh, yeah. And then... Uh, once it was shown to be effective and well, first you have to prove it doesn't do damage, then it's effective, but then it's always, well, that only works for elite athletes and Olympians. And then, Oh, wow. You know, I don't have back pain. In fact, I ended up getting, uh, doing some work with some seal team six guys because of, uh, one of the operators brother had had a chronically destroyed back that was fixed with some of our back protocols he's like, you know, my, my brother was done forever. I get this call out of the blue. He's like, you know, help. Cause we're high mileage. We're beat up. Yeah. And so it's kind of, you know, things like that. If people just take their time, read. If, in fact, if anything else, if the one thing people could do, if they're really invested and want to do better, read. Yeah. Read everything. Read everything. I, I, I don't care what it is. And if you keep, even if you're not a good reader at first, you'll eventually just through practice, get to the point where you can start discerning what's quality material and what's not. You'll yeah. eventually get there, but you have to start. You've got to read, mm-hmm. consume content. Great. You know, watch talks, do podcasts. Rogan is great. All these guys are great, but then you got to take it the next step. You got to do some reading. You got to do some studying. Couldn't agree more. If you don't want to read and you don't want to study, it's okay. But then you have to be willing to accept that you're going to get average or below average results. Mm-hmm. So, so you don't have to do it, but if you're wanting better results, you got to earn them. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been super enlightening. I have learned a ton. I know that my listeners have learned a ton and I highly recommend that everybody go to gymnasticbodies.com. It is the home of gains particularly in the gymnastics <laughs> world. Check, check us out on Instagram. Yep, absolutely. Check them out on Instagram. I'm sure you're on Facebook, YouTube. I haven't done Facebook too much. Uh, I'm behind on YouTube. I need to get YouTube caught up. Uh, they can check my personal account on uh, Instagram is Christopher Summer one And so that one, I don't constrain myself to uh, training. Mm-hmm. It's kind of whatever I find interesting. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we stay more focused on training on the gymnastic bodies, Instagram. Yeah. So whatever, whatever they're in the mood for. Super enlightening, amazing stuff. And uh, having read repeatedly, building the gymnastics body, having gone through not the entire foundations course, but you know, what was uh, relevant to my goals at the time, I can definitely tell people it is money more than well spent. Uh, if anything, you're undercharging for that just brilliant material. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about all the upcoming stuff that you've got coming along at gymnasticsbodies.com. 
Christopher, Christopher Summer. Uh, it was a real pleasure and a great honor to have you on the podcast. I really I appreciate, appreciate it. Alex. I enjoyed it. Absolutely. As did I. And folks, thank you for listening. And as always, have fun and happy training.